My name is Christopher Grumman. I am the managing partner of MAD Investment Solutions, a boutique real estate investment firm based in Nungatar, Mongolia. I have myself lived in Mongolia for the past seven years, and I would like to take this opportunity today to talk to you about how I personally view the current situation in Mongolia and its long-term future as an investment destination. Please bear in mind that I am talking from the perspective of a small business owner working every day on the ground in Mongolia, not from the perspective of the government or the large mining companies. The analogy that I'd like to use today to describe today's relationship between the Mongolian government and foreign investors is the tango. A central, exotic, enticing and sometimes near erotic dance between the foreign investors and the Mongolian government that is often violent and is considered to be a show of skills and strength. The Mongolian tango is known for its two steps forward and one steps backwards move. Depending on the mutual performance of the dance, it may or may not lead to a long-lasting relationship. So the question today is clearly, where are we in this relationship? And are we heading towards the long-lasting relationship we all seek? Let's maybe start by having a look at the recent headlines that have come out of Mongolia over the past four months. The spectre of resource nationalism in Mongolia has come to haunt Ruitinto once again. A string of missteps and delays have made Eden Estevan Tolgoy, JSC, look inept. Royalty and tax proposals threaten OT project. The new foreign investment law and continuing political uncertainty could potentially derail foreign investment in the industry. Parliament, earlier this year, pushed through a half-baked law on investment in strategic sectors that violates every free market rule in the book. The country is on the verge of becoming yet another failed post-socialist experiment in democracy. And my favourite, of course, the crowd has disappeared from Mongolia like a fart in a windstorm. Are we to understand that the eternal blue skies of Mongolia are turning grey? Have investors finally fled Mongolia for good? When analysts look at Mongolia, I often hear them talk of the risks of the Dutch disease. I am not a specialist myself in the matter, but I took the time early in the week to have a look at the Wikipedia page of the Dutch disease. And after going through it, I'll buy it quickly, I am starting to fear that in a couple of years, Wikipedia might well rename the page as the Mongolian disease. If you look at the text within the Wikipedia article, it is clear that Mongolia is rapidly becoming a textbook example of a bad case of the Dutch disease. First of all, the Dutch disease is defined as the apparent relationship between the increase in exploitation of natural resources and a decline in the manufacturing sector. The Dutch disease is comprised of two sectors, the booming sector and the lagging sector. The booming sector is usually the mining of gold, copper, diamond or bauxite. The lagging sector generally refers to manufacturing, but can also refer to agriculture. So far, I feel like I'm describing Mongolia. The resource boom will increase demand for labour, which will cause production to shift towards the booming sector, away from the lagging sector. This leads to a decrease in the price competitiveness and thus the export of the affected country's manufactured goods, as well as an increase in imports. Check for Mongolia. Eventually this leads to high inflation and a number of social and monetary problems for the country. Having said this, I recognise that Mongolia is attempting to improve the situation, but so far the effects are not really being felt. From a macro perspective, the world is still in a global crisis, and this is leading investors to hold off from their most exotic investments, such as Mongolia. Further to this, China has experienced a slowdown in its economy, which means it is now buying less coal from Mongolia, and this is negatively impacting the Mongolian economy. So, can a recent downfall be blamed entirely on the macro station, or should we rather be looking closer to home? When I look at the news coming out of the government, it is often frustrating to see that it does not seem to have its priorities always in place. Allow me to give you one example amongst the many. The Mongolian government insisted on pushing through a half-baked law on foreign investment, instead of the essential piece of legislation that is a new securities law. Without it, the MSC cannot develop properly, nor can the TTIPO move forward. This is one of many vital reforms that are needed to establish solid future foundations for the development of Mongolia. Yet, do you know what was the biggest international news coming from Mongolia in October? 
It was a statue of Lenin being taken down from central Lumita to be auctioned off. How do we get to this situation today? On the surface, it might seem that the summer of 2012 has been nothing but a series of errors in judgment and in policy from Mongolia. We had the China South Kobe Sand situation, which has led to poorly drafted and executed knee jerk FDI law, which was the first signal that not all was rosy in the land of blue skies. While FDI laws and regulations are essentials, they need to be well formulated and thought through properly. This was followed by a parliamentary election based on a platform of resource nationalism. Ever since the elections, we have witnessed constant infighting in the government, which leads many to the conclusion that we are facing an inefficient coalition. Even now, we have MPP parliament members protesting in the government building. All of this on a background of constant demands for the renegotiation of the Oyotongo Agreement, yet again. This has led Rio Tinto and other large-scale investors feeling like they are in a, a caught in a dangerous hostage situation. From a more personal perspective, I have witnessed the collapse of the infrastructure in the city, in particular energy shortages, yet the new power station still seems to be a faraway dream with constant delays. If Mongolia is not able to present a united front with a stable regime for foreign investors, then those same investors will not stick around in the hope that Mongolia gets its act together. Beyond that, there are a vast number of other issues and challenges that are plaguing real growth in Mongolia, but they are symptoms rather than causes of the general challenges of the country. Worsening corruption, increased bureaucracy, legal uncertainty, lack of skilled worker, failing infrastructure are all becoming increasingly serious issues. For those of you who like cartoons, we took the time to try to illustrate our opinion on the current situation and the potential issues if they are not resolved in time. As a first step, it is clear that the Mongolian society, as a whole, has not seen much improvements, if any at all, in their lifestyle. High inflation has actually meant a higher cost of living for a large part of the population. The easy conclusion as to why this is the case is often to blame foreign companies and the arrival of foreign investors. This has eventually reached a crescendo this summer, with regular demands for more cash handouts, for renegotiations of the OT agreement, and for fewer foreign workers to be in the country. As a side note, I would like to talk very briefly about the impact that those cash handouts are having on the economy. The government has now admitted that the cash handouts of the 2008 elections were a mistake and contributed to the inflation and the drop in standards of living. Yet it just announced that it will give out 20,000 two week allowance a month to every child and youth in the country. This amounts to handouts of 13 million US dollars a month. This money could be better used to heat schools, feed kids, buy textbooks and so forth. But this doesn't seem to be compatible with the populist policies of the government. Nevertheless, those demands have been heard by politicians who are responding to it by adding new taxes, creating new FDI laws and generally speaking making the environment yet more unstable. Should the situation not improve dramatically, there is a serious risk of failing to maintain a fair balance of the environment between the foreign investors and the Mongolian government. Mongolia has to realise that it cannot develop its economy without a steady flow of foreign investment in the country to improve its trade balance. Let's not forget that Mongolia is not a manufacturing country and thus needs to import practically everything it needs. Its sole exports, on the other hand, are only commodities and cashmere. After all this depressing news, is it still worth investing in Mongolia? Does it have opportunities which are worthwhile? How long until Mongolia gets back on track and pushes forward to improve stability and a good working environment? Will the current grey skies of Mongolia remain eternally so, or will we return to beautiful blue skies we had previously? Before we start looking at investment opportunities, let's first cover the basic essentials of what is Mongolia today. Let's briefly explore together the fundamentals that make the Mongolia of today as it is. The country is landlocked. Sandwich between Russia and China, as most of you already know. Mongolia is made up of a surprisingly large territory of over 1.5 million square kilometers. This is the equivalent of France, the UK, Germany and Italy put together with a little bit to spare. The country is very much driven by its capital city of Ulubatar, with over half the population currently residing in the city. 
In terms of infrastructure, Mongolia still has much, has much progress to do, with a single railway track running from China to Russia, and only 5% of its roads, with few roads they are, paved. Surprisingly, Mongolia has a population of 33 million heads of cattle, for only 2.7 million inhabitants. I believe it is, it is the only country in the world to have such a high ratio of people versus cattle. According to the latest official census, we only have 16,500 officially registered foreigners resident in Mongolia, of which 52% are Chinese, 3,500 are Westerners, 15% are Russians, and the remaining 1,800 are split between Kazakhs, North Koreans, Vietnamese, Turks, and so forth. Mongolia benefits from having an extremely young population, with nearly half of its population still in education and soon to join the workforce. 46% of the population is of working age, and only 5% are considered aging, a fairly unique situation in the region, particularly when compared to China, Russia, and Japan, that all have a massively aging population. Of the 2.7 million people in the country, 70% live in an urban environment, while 30% still lead a nomadic lifestyle tending to cattle. Education in Mongolia is a legacy from the Soviet Union days, but still achieves a staggering 97% literacy rates, one of the highest in Asia and no small feat when you consider that Mongolia has the lowest population density in the world. In terms of religion, Mongolia is well balanced and there are no religious tensions amongst the population. Just over half the population is Buddhist, while 40% are atheists, and only 3% declare themselves to be Islamists, mostly from the western Kazakh regions. Interestingly, only 2% of the population is registered as being Christian. Importantly, Mongolia has a single unifying language, which is written on two scripts. One is a new Cyrillic alphabet, while the old Mongolian script is coming back into fashion. Most important of all is the use of language, and today in Mongolia we benefit from having considerable freedom of speech. People vote in fair and democratic elections every four years. They have just voted for new parliaments, and the people of Mongolia will vote for the president in about seven months. The parliament is split fairly evenly between the Democratic Party at 46% and the MPP at 33% while the Justice Coalition only has about 14% of the seats, and the Civil Will Green Party, as well as the independent candidates, make up the rest. Mongolia practices is now famous for a neighbor policy with great efficiency. It essentially means that when given a choice, they would much rather trade with any other country than Russia or China. The closest third neighbors are generally considered to be the US, South Korea, Japan, Australia, Canada, and the EU. GDP growth in the country has been staggering, and while we are now at about 4,000 USD per capita, we expect to reach a GDP per capita of nearly 12,000 USD by 2016. The currency, the Mongolian National Tugrik, has been extremely stable over the last uh, few years against the United States dollars, and is considered to be a reasonably solid currency by its national watchdogs. Monthly average disposable income has been going up consistently over the past six years, and we see little reason for it to slow down anytime soon. UB is a nomad city. Interestingly, of the 1.3 million inhabitants of Lombatar, only about 40% live in national buildings with solid walls, while the vast majority, 60%, still live in a traditional nomadic type of housing known as a go. Lombatar is a crowded city with an average household size of about six people quite a lot of an average apartment size of only 65 square meters. That's about 10 square meters per person. We call UB a horse riding city. Despite Mongols swapping the horse with the car, the principle is the same. We have a staggering 170,000 cars for only 125,000 property titles. The 125 property titles includes all types of property not only residential, but also commercial, retail, industrial, and so forth. Another interesting tidbit is that of the 170,000 cars officially registered in UB, over 70% of them have a value of over 20,000 US dollars. In terms of real estate, we have seen considerable growth over the past few years, and currently average prices per square meter stand at, for low to mid-residential, is between 1,500 USD 
to 3,000 USD per square meter. Mid to high in residential is between 2,500 to 10,000 USD per square meter. Grade A in the office is between 2,000 and 6,000 USD per square meter. While grade A in the retail currently sells at anywhere between 2,000 and 7,000 USD per square meter. When looking at Mongolia, it is important to keep a sense of perspective compared to other countries. Politicians the world over have populist ideas. They don't always make the right decisions. The French president, Monsieur Hollande, is a clear example of that, with a 75% tax on rich that has only just now been repaired. I also took the time last week to look at China's FDI regulations. They are considerably more stringent and unstable than Mongolia's. Australia introduced controversial new mining taxes that pushed back the Australian economy considerably and cost the Prime Minister his job. In October 2012, Canada denied Petronas of Malaysia mining rights in Western Canada, just as Mongolia recently did for Chanalco and South Kobe Sands. Belgium, my own country, went through 18 months without a government, so a little infighting in the government is nothing new and is sometimes healthy. Beyond that, let's not forget that Mongolia is still the very best performing economy globally, in particular when compared to China and the new poster child for emerging markets, Myanmar. Let's not even talk about Europe, which is still firmly in a recession. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that the Mongolian economy is a roller cost economy and will remain so for the next couple of decades. We are still laying today the foundations of the economy. But I am confident that despite its ups and downs, the direction is definitely positive. It is now time for foreign investors and the Mongolian government to lay the first foundations of a real relationship. Initially, a simple, shaky ladder will do, but will eventually develop into a solid bridge between our two cultures. Let's now discuss investment opportunities in the country. There's still a number of exciting opportunities available to those foreign investors able to look to the, to the horizon and Mongolia's extraordinary potential. In terms of real estate, I am not talking about building more mega projects or large shopping malls. I am talking about sourcing those niche products that provide an excellent return on investment, are easy to put in place and simply make sense. For instance, it is clear that there is a considerable need for self storage solutions in UB. There is practically no affordable housing solutions and we must develop Mongolia's secondary cities. In our culture, Mongolia needs to achieve food security. During the Soviet years, the country was a net exporter of wheat and other crops to the Soviet Union. There is no reason why this can't be replicated in a more sustainable and economical functioning, functional way. Mining supply chain. Regardless of who actually ends up mining in Mongolia, mining activity in the country will boom over the coming years and be the country's main industry for the foreseeable future. The mining supply chain in Mongolia is still in its infancy and presents considerable opportunity for investors. Infrastructure. Mongolia's future growth is dependent on massive investments into its infrastructure, and this presents real opportunities for large-scale investments alongside the government, in particular in roads, rails, and the energy sectors. Education. With nearly half the population that is still in school and university age, incredible opportunities exist in the education sector. We have already seen considerable progress in the past few years, with a British school recently opened, as well as a new American university, but much remains to be done. Auditing. In terms of auditing and evaluating services, while the big four all have e uh, small offices in the country, the waiting lists are often long. There are absolutely no property evaluators in the country and a big lack of tax specialists. As the economy of the country develops and grows, there is going to be increasing demand for such services. Construction materials. <coughs> Mongolia is going through the biggest construction boom of its history and along with the mining boom is in much need for construction materials. This means cement, steel, tiles and everything in between. Renewable energy. Mongolia is a vast country with huge energy needs, yet only Newcomb seems to have grasped the opportunity that this represents. Wind farms are perfect for Mongolia and are expected to become a serious sector of investment in the near future. It is clear to me that the year 2013 will be an exceptional year for investments in Mongolia. The slowdown is bringing out worthwhile opportunities across the board. It is actually giving Mongolia the chance to settle down, and strengthen their offerings and bring stability to the country. From a personal perspective, 
I think that we'll see fewer cowboy investors and more smart money coming into the sector. Finally, and very briefly, I want to talk to you about MAD Investment Solutions. MAD was established about two and a half years ago. It is a specialist boutique investment firm based in Mongolia and working exclusively in the real estate sector. We specialize in representing foreign investors, mostly family offices who want to make the most of Mongolia's most exciting investment sector. Today, MAD has an incredible online presence. Our website has over 45,000 visitors a month. Our Facebook page is one of the largest in Mongolia, with over 26,000 followers. Our website is also host to one of the largest set of resources in Mongolia, with over 200 different new content being added on a monthly basis. We also have a newsletter that goes out to over 8,000 subscribers. In terms of services that we offer, we work exclusively in real estate and have operations on the ground with a wide range of turnkey services, including rental and sales, as well as considerable research capacity. Thank you very much for listening and we very much hope to see you in the near future.